Next lecture would be a guest lecture on deprescribing in old adults. May I now coordinate invite the chairpersons, Professor Shamila Metananda and Professor E. Kajanakabaho to introduce the speaker. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am uh, Dr. Bahu, specialist in Indian and medicine. I am not a professor, <laughs> it's my mistake. Anyway, my co chair is uh, Professor Shamila Metananda. And today our lecture is Deep Prescribing in All the Adults. It's an important topic. And I will ask my, request my co chair to invite the speaker. Thank you, Bahu. Uh, so today, the guest lecture is on deprescribing in older adults, which is a very, very important topic for especially Sri Lanka. We see like our population is aging, and we see a lot of polypharmacy among aging population. And our speaker today is Professor Chandani Vanigatunga. She does not need any introduction. Uh, she's the best person to talk about deprescribing. Uh, she is the chair professor of uh, pharmacology at the uh, University of Sri Javadanapura. Um, without further ado, uh, I would like to invite uh, Professor uh, Vani Gatunga to uh, deliver her lecture. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chamila, for that introduction. Uh, thank you very much for the president and the council of the SLSIM for this uh, singular honor. It's always a pleasure to be with physicians and again one of my uh, associations and colleges as well. So without much ado, let me introduce you to a patient that I met at the start of my career. An 82-year-old gentleman, Mr. A, who is a diabetic with a reasonable blood glucose control, quite independent with his ADLs. He has suddenly developed a leg ulcer for which he had sought treatment. So he went to the doctor and said that I've got some pain in my legs and I'm also finding it difficult to sleep because of the pain. So the doctor who saw him cleaned his wound, prescribed coamoxiclav, celecoxib, and clobazam, and said anyway, just go and see a surgeon. So he saw the surgeon who also cleaned his wound, continued the coamoxiclav, replaced celecoxib with uh, paracetamol and added diazepam and carbazepine because he's finding it difficult to sleep and has some leg pain. I saw him four days later. He was wheeled in by his son, drowsy, unable to walk. There was some slurring of his speech. Uh, so when I saw him, he was very drowsy, but drowsable. And when you could rouse him, he was very coherent. He answered my questions well. There was some slurring of his speech, but his neurological examination was normal. So looking at the medicines, he was at that point of time on coamoxiclab, paracetamol, diazepam, carbamazepine, and clobazam, and of course, metformin for his um, diabetes. I didn't know really what to do, but I just stopped these three because I knew that all three of them could cause him to be sleepy. And one week later, when I got him down for my review, he came walking, of course, with some aid, but he was fine, back to where he was. Wound was healing. He was alert, could manage his normal work. He was one of my game-changing patients or life-changing patients, and that got me into looking at deprescribing in older adults. So being a pharmacologist, I love deprescribing more than prescribing. I've been asked to talk about deprescribing in older adults, and over the next 15 minutes, I'll take you through what deprescribing is, and why do we really need to look at deprescribing for older adults? It's good for everybody to you know, think about deprescribing, but why specifically in older adults? And how should we set about deprescribing in any patient, and in particular, the older adults? So if you look at prescribing, which is what all of us do, and that's what we are really trained to do, 
we look at the best available evidence, use our clinical judgment, and consider the patient's circumstances, values, and preferences, and decide on what to give. As Sakat said in 1996, combining them together, getting the right mix is actually what is meant by evidence-based medicine. Now, when I was starting my postgraduate career, evidence-based medicine was looking at guidelines and prescribing. I used to ignore these other two things until I really read his article. Uh, and where he says that it's about integrating individual clinical experience and the best external evidence. So it's bringing all three together. If that's prescribing, what is deprescribing? So deprescribing is a process. It's not a single step, it's a process of medication withdrawal with provisions to restart if something goes wrong, supervised by a prescriber or a healthcare professional with a goal of managing polypharmacy and improving outcomes. So that fits to any of our patients. What is different from what I did with Mr. A and with deprescribing is deprescribing is proactive. What I did with Mr. A was a reactive thing. He came with a problem, I stopped his medicines, and he improved, fortunately he improved. Deprescribing is proactive. You look at it beforehand and try to identify the possible issues, and then you try and prevent it. So I'll put to you that deprescribing also involves looking at the best available evidence, patient circumstances, values, and preferences, and clinical judgment of the prescriber. Now, when you apply this to older adults, your best available evidence now becomes less. Because when you look at most of the clinical evidence that we have, they have come from patient populations which have really not included these older adults in their studies. Patients' preferences and values have also changed. As a young person, you would want to have a life which is free of complications, free of any other problems. Your whole life is ahead of you. You have responsibilities and obligations, but as you grow older, you want to be comfortable and maybe live peacefully without a lot of drama. Clinical judgment of the prescriber therefore becomes extremely important because balancing this needs a lot of attention. Older adults are at a greater risk of what we term as potentially inappropriate prescribing. They have a lot of diseases, they take a lot of medicines, their systems are different from young people, so therefore the medicine handling and how the medicines work in their body will change. They have limited psychological reserve, limited finances, so increased healthcare costs can be a problem. They are at increased risk of ADRs, unlike the younger people, and all these together might actually decrease their quality of life. So why should we deprescribe then in this older population? We can reduce the pill burden, and that's a huge issue. If you see any older people, because of their multiple comorbidities, they come with a lot of medicines. Some of them needed, some of them not really necessary. It is expensive, and in today's context, if people are to buy their medicines outside, particularly in Sri Lanka, that's going to cause a huge burden on the family. So it will reduce the healthcare cost. And when you have more drugs, obviously you have more side effects and more chance of interactions, we'll reduce those as well. People go to various prescribers and the care is fragmented. So deprescribing may reduce the effects of multiple prescribers and I think that is where the internists can play a very crucial role because the person can look at the patient as a whole, not in isolation with their diseases or one single problem, and then ask, your, ask himself or herself whether it's really necessary to get all these medicines. Yes, he has five diseases, 10 guidelines telling them different goals, but for this particular patient, is that what is needed? When the complexities are reduced, it would may improve medication adherence as well. You would tell me then, that is the same for anybody, and I'll agree. But when you look at older adults, there are certain other factors that come in. It will reduce the risk of falls, because older adults are at a greater risk of having falls. It will improve or preserve their cognitive function. Some drugs can worsen them. 
They, some of them are also frail and demented. And those are two factors that may increase the medication-related harm and, of course, shift your management goals. There's also a change in life expectancy. Consider a person who was active in his 40s, who developed just atrial, non valvular atrial fibrillation and was given warfarin sometime later to reduce a risk of strokes. All that's fine. Consider him in his 80s, falling most of the time, bed bound, risk of bleeding, and now the risk benefit balance changes. He doesn't want to get bed bound with a bleed. So the life expectancy of the management goals change in older adults. And therefore, it is important for us then to look at whether the medicines need to change or even stop. Why here in Sri Lanka? That's our demography. 7% in 2000 were over 65. Today, at 2023, it's nearly 12%. Halfway into the century, it'll be doubling. And then when it comes to the end of this century, we will have nearly 50% of our people above the age of 65 years. As of now, most of our adults are increasingly living alone, maybe with another older spouse, with a lot of disabilities, and in the community. So that's a population we are looking at. If you look at them, they have multiple comorbidities on multiple diseases. And in a study that we did, where we looked at 468 patients, so 468 prescriptions, one per patient, we found that 97.4% of these prescriptions had at least one or more potentially inappropriate prescription, which was either an inappropriate medicine or something that should be given but not given, so a potentially inappropriate prescription omission. That's a problem. So how then do we describe, do we de uh, de-prescribe? Three important steps. We need to obtain all the available information that we can from our patients. What are they actually taking? They might be having five prescriptions, but they might not be taking half of the medicines that we have given. Do they have any problems with these medicines? Are they experiencing side effects? And what are their perception about it? Will it stop them from taking the essential medicines that can improve the outcomes? Do, we have, do they have any issues with adherence? Taking, for example, an inhaler. Can they coordinate and, improve and take the medicine? Do you need something else to facilitate that process? Are there any risks to medication-induced harms in these patients, like frailty, falls, dementia, making complex prescribing regimes difficult, and comorbidities? And more importantly, how do these medicines fit into their expectations, preference, and lifestyles? We might want them to have a good glycemic control, but for that person in her 80s, it might be better for her to have a cup of tea with a little bit of sugar and enjoy the rest of her life as opposed to tight glucose control. We need to identify drugs that can be potentially de-prescribed. That's a second step. Where there is no indication or benefit, that's easy. If drugs are causing actual harm or adverse events, that's also easy. If drugs are at higher risk for causing problems in older adults, or if there are potentially inappropriate medicines, Importantly, if they have been started due to a prescribing cascade, where you give a drug to control a problem, another drug to control another side effect, and so on, preventive indication is irrelevant because of the limited life expectancy, or medicines where people themselves have stopped for various reasons and are okay without them, which tells us, in other words, that really these medicines may not necessarily be needed. So when you look at the commonly prescribed medicines to de-prescribe in older adults, there are lots of risks, but benzos, PPIs, long-term use of bisphosphonates, antipsychotics and anticholinergics head all these lists. So if your patient is on any one of them, it may be worth looking at it again. There are many aids to identify what to de-prescribe. They will help, definitely, but I would put to you that nothing is better than the clinical judgment, and that is when our brains should work. You need to look at the benefits, look at the risks. Are there alternatives? Is there nothing that you can do? Or do you have to do anything at all? 
The third process, the third step in the prescribing is that it needs to be planned. You need to identify what has to be prescribed, how to deprescribe, what is the order, the one that causes most problems, if it is not relevant, might be the one to come down soon. We need to actively involve our healthcare providers, their patients and caregivers, and ensure that there is ongoing communication so that you revisit an issue that crops up. It is important for us as prescribers to remember that deprescribing is a trial. You might have to go back, start the drug again, and then think of deprescribing as you go on. One slide about adverse drug withholding events, which can have a huge negative impact on the deprescribing process. You stop a drug, totally rational, done everything properly, but the patient ends up with either the disease coming back or a problem, that's going to cause a problem now in the confidence of that patient to not take that medicine. So tapering the doses, close monitoring are things that we can use to avoid these adverse drug withholding events. There are a couple of issues when we look at deprescribing. We fear that the condition can get worse, and that is a rational reason to worry about. There's evidence to suggest that deprescribing in older adults can be safe without any untoward harms. Of course, the evidence is not so robust as the evidence that we have to prescribe, but this evidence is coming as well. Practically, one of the biggest problems any one of us will encounter is deprescribing what somebody else has prescribed because you don't know really what has happened, what has gone into that thought process. Our medical culture is geared for us to prescribe, not really to deprescribe, and that is central to our professional identity of doing something. Clinical inertia, it's much easier to just cruise along without really upsetting the cart. And of course, deprescribing is a complex, time-consuming process. And that's one of the biggest problems we have. Patients, of course, have their own perceptions as to why they are taking medicines. And you suddenly tell them, OK, I don't want your blood sugar to be highly tightly controlled. I'm all right for you to you know, enjoy your life a little bit. Or this drug is not really needed for you. And they have their own fears. We need to address those as well. They might perceive the prescribing as giving up on them whereas it is actually optimizing care. When can we deprescribe? We can do it at any time. When they come into the hospital with an acute problem, in the clinic, especially at palliation, when they are nearing their end of life, of course, therefore, any time is a good time. Deprescribing is, can be derailed very easily. Adverse drug withholding events or adverse drug withholding reactions, which are much more complex than these events, can easily deprescribe the process that you have started and derail it. However, if you empower your patients and their caregivers, telling them what to expect if you stop, and with very good communication with the people involved, you will be able to bring it back on track. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, to sum up, I said there are three steps. So if you're deprescribing in older adults, it is a proactive clinical process. It's a clinical process, and that's something it's important to remember. So we need to review all current medicines, identify the ones that we need to stop, substitute, or reduce, plan the regime, and frequently review and support the patient. So it's a cycle that goes on. You can always go the other way and see what is going on. It is a proactive, clinical process that all of us must consciously adhere to when we are working with older adults. I said we are at 12% currently with our older population. In 2050, halfway through the century, some of us here will be in that older population. Most of you will be almost looking at that age category. At the end of the century, probably none of us will be here but 50% of Sri Lanka's population will be older people, which is why we need to be thinking about it actively, working now so that it becomes part of our management plan to deprescribe, because we are looking at a vulnerable population for a lot of drug-related problems. So that's it from me.
thank you very much again for all the uh, for inviting me to be here. Thank you for that excellent thought-provoking uh, lecture. It's very important for the old young people and the current elderly population. May I ask the audience any questions you want to clarify? because of others are not, uh, this is the system I think we are facing problems. Sometimes people start emergency department, some medication coming to the ward and on discharge, unnoticed and start discharging with so many medications. How do you think we can tackle this in the system? Um, in the system again, I think it's the same process. We, when we get a patient, we look at the patient at that point of time. So you raised a very valid point. Those who come from the emergency and then in the acute state, we actually start medicines which are really not needed on long-term management. So that long-term management plan, the discharge plan is something we probably need to think of when they are in the wards. So as I said, de-prescribing is something that needs to be built into our system because we are all geared to prescribe and not to de-prescribe. So the system is there. It's very easy for us to intervene at different times as long as we are aware that uh, you know, we need to look at the medicines every single time the patient comes in a critical way and ask ourselves, are they needed? Thank you for that valuable comments. Because the, during the ward sound, every day our management pattern, every day we should check our prescription chart. That is the way we can reduce. Because just treating, history taking, examination, every day we look at the medications and we have to alter the medication if not necessary. Thank you for the excellent that lecture and thought provoking. I will ask my co-chair, Professor Chamle Metananda, to hand over the appreciation certificate. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Moving on.